when I walk, I walk with a bit of a limp. And often people seem curious and then stare. Many times they look uncomfortable. And in those moments, I want to ease their discomfort and start a conversation. So I'm here today to share with you how to communicate effectively and positively with persons with disabilities. I haven't always walked like this. Let me take you on a journey with me. Are you ready? Let's start on that cold December night in 2006. I was in downtown Riverside enjoying the Christmas lights festivities when I eventually walked into that dark pub to warm up. And soon after stepping in, I made eye contact with that brown eyed girl on the dance floor and her warm smile made me feel like I had known her for years, but I was way too shy to approach her. So I just waited for Thursdays, seeing her at that same place before asking for her number. And we got along great. So six months later, I finally had the courage to ask her to be my girlfriend. I asked her by putting this message on a t-shirt. The message read, Natalia, will you be my girlfriend? There was a yes box, a no box, and I need more time to think box. So on that day, I handed her a Sharpie and she asked, what's the Sharpie for? So I opened my jacket to reveal that message. And you got it. She checked the yes box. And one year later, we got married. She then moved into my downtown Spanish style apartment so we could save up for a house. And a year later, we did it. We bought a house. And I remember being in that moment thinking, wow, I have this amazing spouse. We're both making decent money. And now we have a house. I sure felt like I was on top of the world. I thought I had it all. And I was about to find out how quickly things can change. Just three weeks later, we decided that I would build a fire pit in our backyard. Just a place for us to socialize with our friends. Natalia was 29. I was 36. After unloading all of the material out of the back of the truck, I could no longer use my left arm. It was completely numb. So I walked inside on that hot sunny September day and asked Natalia to please take me to the hospital. Something is wrong. She immediately took me to the emergency room where I passed out. The first thing I saw when I opened my eyes was a friend I had known since the third grade. His name was Javier. I asked him, where are we and what are you doing here? He replied, you're in the intensive care unit at Kaiser. Well, what happened? The doctor gave you a 5% chance of surviving through last night, so we all came to say goodbye. As I looked around the room full of friends and family, many of whom I hadn't seen for a long time, Javier was hesitant to tell me more about what happened. He said, it's complicated. And just then the doctor walked in and sat on the left side of my bed. He explained, Donnie, you had a massive stroke. You lost about 95% of the right hemisphere of your brain. You will probably never walk again. Your life is going to be very difficult. No, no, no. I was just on top of the world. I spent my entire first day at the physical rehabilitation hospital complaining. And by day's end, I was thoroughly disgusted with all of my negativity. So after dinner in the cafeteria, I went to my room to have a conversation with myself. I asked myself if being negative was helping, and I clearly saw that it wasn't. It was dragging me down. And that's when I realized it was going to take hard work and a positive mindset to get through this. So the next day and beyond, I stayed true to working hard and staying positive. And just one month later, I was sent home, able to walk with a single point cane, very slowly, but I could do it. And then it was about three weeks after getting home from rehab, I was still in my wheelchair due to my slow pace. 
But that's when I started to notice that I was being seen differently because I was in a wheelchair. When Natalia and I would go to dinner pre-stroke, the servers always put the bill in front of me after the meal. Not sometimes, always. All of a sudden, while sitting at that table in a wheelchair, the servers started putting the bill in front of Natalia, as if to imply a man in a wheelchair could not possibly be able to pay the bill. And that might have made me smile for saving money if only we didn't share an account. <laughs> Instead, it was just an implicit bias. Months later, still in my wheelchair, I made it to the front door one Friday afternoon to get some fresh air, and I heard the sound of a bat hitting a baseball. Ping! Oh, and because of my love for baseball, I had no choice but to find out what was going on across the street. So I spent the next three Fridays sitting in my wheelchair, watching batting practice at that local high school, until I was invited into the dugout for a scrimmage game and then to be an assistant coach. It was about a month after becoming an assistant, I started a program that I called the Baseball Bunch. And that's where I took the baseball team into the classroom with the students with severe disabilities each Friday for lunch and some interaction. And after some time, we started going to the baseball field once a month to play wiffle ball with those students. One of those students was Vicky. She had Down syndrome. And boy, by her smile, we could sure tell she had a crush on Wyatt, our center fielder. So when time came to go to prom, I signed up to be a chaperone. And I got to watch Wyatt walk through those doors to have a dance with Vicky and then to the photo booth to take some fun photos. Wouldn't you know it, Wyatt has since graduated from high school and college. He is now a special education teacher in Oregon. I say, wow, Wyatt. I also decided to go to college to become a teacher and possibly a head high school baseball coach. I ended up graduating from California State University of San Bernardino with a degree in communication studies and most likely the highest GPA they have ever seen with a 6.4 GPA. Yes, let me explain. First, let me share one of the other speakers here today told me she graduated college with a 4.0 GPA, but then she told me she did that with a full brain. <laughs> so to be clear, on paper, I graduated with a 3.2 GPA. But let's remember, I did that missing 95% of the right side of my brain. So to level the playing field, I just multiplied my 3.2 by 2 to make it a 6.4. <laughs> that seemed fair to me. What do you think? In doing my research for this talk, I came across an article titled which is my good leg. It was co-authored by Charles and Don Braithwaite. This article talks about intercultural communication with persons with disabilities. And one of the points it makes is the fear that people have in talking with someone in the blind community. They apparently have this fear of saying the wrong thing and offending that blind person by saying something like, see you later. And I chuckle because in my empirical research, I met a blind man on the city bus. Yes, I use the city bus because I'm blind in the left side of both eyes, so I don't drive. And you're welcome. <laughs> and that's where I met Sai. Sai stepped on the bus wearing dark sunglasses, using his white cane. He was blind. So this man has never seen a thing in his life, as it turns out, yet. Each time our conversation ends, Sai says to me, Donnie, see you later. <laughs> so maybe what Sai is telling us is not to worry so much about what we say, but maybe how we say it. And please don't grab a blind person by their arm to guide them if that situation arises. Instead, let them grab yours. Come on, let's talk about your body language, gestures, and proximity to those persons with disabilities. If you're used to turning your head away to avoid that person with a disability, I encourage you to make eye contact with them, just like you would with the person in front of them walking through the mall. 
not pointing at that short-statured person simply because that's not what you are used to seeing. Instead, seeing them as a person first. And now, if you're in a conversation with them and someone else, do you distance yourself from that person with a disability while standing closer to that person without a disability? Our awareness is key here. By stepping further away from them, they may easily interpret that as though you are scared of them. Let's just act like we normally would with anyone else. They are a person first. How about showing less sympathy and more empathy? I have a pretty large social circle of people with disabilities, and I have yet to meet one that wants you to feel sorry for them. So I encourage you to stop the pity party and instead flip it to imagining what it would be like to be in their shoes. And if you can do that, big things can start to change as far as your fear and uncertainty of how to act or what to say. And then when you find yourself in the vicinity of a person with a disability and you want to avoid them because you just don't know what to do, please just stop and ask yourself, what is the kindest way to treat them right now? Because being kind doesn't cost a dime. That was such a great lesson my grandpa taught me 43 years ago as a seven-year-old. One day we pulled over to help a stranger push start his baby blue Volkswagen bug. And after getting the man on his way, my grandpa put his arm around me and said, remember, Donnie, being kind doesn't cost a dime. And please understand, being kind isn't only going to look like you running up 100 feet so you can open the door for a person using a wheelchair. They are living and navigating through their day in their own way. Now, if you're at the door and you notice the person behind you might appreciate the assistance, then I hope you hold it open for them empathy, not sympathy, because they don't want you to feel sorry for them. So after leaving here today, let's remember to make eye contact with that person with the disability. Don't increase the distance between you and them. Don't point at them and teach your children to do the same. Be aware of your body language and your biases towards those persons with disabilities and encourage your kids to start programs in schools that will include those students with disabilities. They are people just like you. One of the first things I said today was that I wanted to share how to communicate effectively and positively with persons with disabilities. The reason for the word positively is because it's impossible to not communicate. Let me say that again. It's impossible to not communicate. So turning your head away to avoid that person with the disability, that's effectively communicating with them. And I think we can agree that's not a very positive way. So by now, you should all be better equipped to communicate effectively and positively with persons with disabilities. And if you get stuck, like we all can at times, let's remember, being kind doesn't cost a dime. I'm Donnie Everson. <laughs>